let's have a cup of tea. So welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be fixing the C63 front left wheel bearing. How do I know that it needs a new wheel bearing? Well, when I go round a right hand corner at motorway speeds, there is a humming noise. And when I go round a left hand corner, there's absolutely no humming noise. And it sounds like it's coming from the front and just logically it would make more sense because when you're going around a right hand, the weight is all on that left wheel bearing. Now, I actually did a video, if you're a subscriber of the channel, you'll remember that I did a video about this humming noise. I couldn't work out where it was coming from. It turned out to be the tires and the tires had a weird wear on them, especially the front left. Now, I think that's because of this wheel bearing. So I'm gonna change it and see if it makes a difference. If not, then I'll move on to the next thing. Now, I make a mistake whilst doing this and keep your eye out for it. Let me know down below in the comments if you spot it because it's quite a serious one and I go and rectify it later on in the video. And I just wanna say a big thank you to Martin at All Data. All Data, an online provider of OEM workshop instructions for all different vehicle manufacturers. And I contacted Martin and he really helped me out. So more on that later, big thank you to them. Just to give you a feeling of cost for this, the wheel bearing assembly, Mercedes no longer sell a wheel bearing kit to me or themselves, I don't think either. So you have to buy a whole wheel bearing assembly that cost me 210 pounds and the bolts and everything cost 18 pounds. So in total, 228 pounds to do this fix. So um, yeah, less talking, more work, let's go. First start on this process is to always chock your wheels. I'm raising the front, so I'm gonna chock my rear wheels. Here's a little trick that you can do if you have nice wheels and in particular, nice black AMG ones and don't have access to rubber coated sockets. Wrap some masking tape around your socket so that you don't scratch the inside of the wheel. This is the first time I've jacked the C63 up, believe it or not, so it took a little bit of time to work out the best way to do it. The C63 features lots of plastic underneath because, you know, aerodynamics, so it is a bit of a pain to find out where to place your axle stands. Luckily, Mercedes have put one really large jacking pad under the front of the car and then one smaller one on each sill. The sill jacking points actually are made from a hard plastic and feature a unique shape to stop the car from moving about whilst you jack it up and preventing damage to your sill. First time that I've ever seen this. Next step for me was to remove the wheel. Turning the wheels makes your life a lot easier as you can access all of the bolts much easier. The caliper bolts are torqued to 180 Nm, so I'd recommend a big breaker bar for this so that you don't do your back or neck in. Ask me how I know. This time I've double hung the caliper with a redundant safety loop as I don't want to find out how expensive these calipers are to replace if I drop it. On a side note, these calipers are some of the biggest that I've ever worked on. The six pistons will give most supercars a run for their money. Take the disc off, and again this is one of the largest and heaviest brake discs that I've ever handled. My car is fitted with standard steel rotors and not the optional composite rotors fitted on some C63s. However, don't be fooled by the marketing hype. Composite in the C63 world does not mean it's made of carbon fibre. Yes. Oh, that's a heavy disc. Oh, Jesus. Now we get to look at the wheel bearing for the first time and I really need an impact wrench on here to spin up the nut to a high speed and see if I can hear anything. But it did feel a bit grainy when turning it by hand. See if you can hear it. There's a little bit of grinding actually in there. I'm not going to take the other wheel off but you can hear it grinding. There's four bolts that hold the wheel bearing assembly to the steering knuckle. One of them is very inaccessible. Thanks Mercedes. There is just no way of getting to that because you can't get any socket near it. I'll try a stubby, but I don't think so. Even with a stubby, no way. Further disassembly of the steering knuckle is required, so time to remove the coilover. Now, this is not the way that I'd want to do this. I'd want to have a 21mm here and then a ratchet there, like this. But I don't have a 21mm closed spanner. There 
This nut and bolt assembly is probably torqued to around 150 newton meters. So far, so good. That's it. To me, this is a very strange looking nut. It's almost like a castle nut without a cotter pin. More about this later. In total, there's three bolts holding the coil over onto the steering knuckle. After removing the two on the back of the knuckle, I punched out the bolt on the top fixing of the coil over, hoping that this would allow the steering knuckle to swing forwards and give me access to the hidden wheel bearing assembly bolt. Realising, finally, that the front lower control arm had to come off and prying it off with my pry bar had no effect, I tried tapping it with a couple of different tools and still nothing. Finally, I gave in and went to Halfords. Big thank you to Halfords for being open on a bank holiday. I bought this bearing puller for £40 only to realise that it wouldn't fit over the huge Mercedes lower control arm or ball joint. So some modification was required and I realised that filing it was going to take far too long. And the angle grinder did the trick. Off came the lower control arm and released the ball joint from the steering knuckle. Finally. That's the culprit. Now to move the wheel speed sensor out of the way so that we have full droop on the steering knuckle. Why isn't that going out? There we go. So I think that was about three and a half hours just to get that off. Just because I didn't have a bearing puller, but now I have a bearing puller and it's wide enough to fit a Mercedes ball joint. So yeah, three and a half, maybe four hours for that one nut. And there we have it, finally the wheel bearing assembly is out. Applying Loctite to the four wheel bearing screws, I can now offer up the new wheel bearing into the steering knuckle. Three I can carry on, but the camera struggles. And the batteries for the Ryobi light are on charge, so... We'll see if they charge up in the time that it goes dark. Got my tea though, that's the main thing. Right, torque these up. FCP Euro, 80 Newton meters. Talking an object that has freedom to move is quite difficult, obviously, understandably, because you can't apply any torque to it because it's moving. So I decided to support it with the trolley jack underneath. This allowed me a solid platform to start the talking process. Oh, right, these Mercedes torque specs are almost impossible to find. Almost impossible. Which is mad considering this car's 10 years old. So that's correct. So that's 100 newton meters and then 90 degrees. And then the little ones are 70 newton meters release and then 100 newton meters. So if you didn't get that from my mumbling to myself, there's a two stage talking process for most of these big coilover and steering knuckle bolts. The two into the back of the steering knuckle are 70 newton meters release and then 100 newton meters. And the large nut and bolt assembly on the top of the coilover is 100 newton meters release and then 90 degrees. That's 100 to there. That's 45. Then one more, 45. Oh, 
that'll do it. Oh, talk. Ah, easy. You should always torque up suspension bolts under load, aka a normal driving condition. Now this is really hard with the wheel on because you can't get to any of these bolts. So how I do it is to jack up the steering knuckle until the car lifts off the closest axle stand. And this is how I know that it's simulating normal ride height of the car. Okay, did you spot the mistake? Be honest, let me know down below in the comments. Where it was, was I said, oh yeah, this is like a castle nut without a cotter pin. That's not true. These nuts are like castle nuts, but there is no cotter pin. The nut is actually a self-locking nut, and as you tighten it up, it deforms the thread on the bolt so that the nut can't vibrate loose. And the one on the bottom of the, the big lower control arm is actually a self-locking nut. That's this one. And I can see they've changed the design. The old ones had like the split system like that, but the new ones have a locking nut on them so that they don't vibrate loose as well, that nylock. So yeah, that's the first mistake. The second mistake, let's explain it now. Now, the second one is a bit more of an important one. So bolts under really high torque, although made of metal, should be thought more of as a spring. Have you ever wondered why some bolts have a torque value and then an angle application after the torque value? So for the purpose of this demonstration, this piece of wire is this bolt, okay? So if you plotted a stress strain graph of this bolt and you did a normal torque, you tightened it up, it's gonna stay looking like that. But if you apply a really high torque, this bolt will go past its elastic zone and into the plastic zone. So it'll look more like that. So this point where it crosses over from the elastic zone, and they call it elastic because the bolt can bounce back to shape, into the plastic zone, that's plastic deformation, is called the bolt's elastic limit. So if I really torque this bolt up, it's gonna stretch it, and it's crossed over its, its elastic limit. After this point, the bolt is in plastic deformation, meaning that if I reinstall this bolt and I re-torque it, it's gonna go to something like that, meaning that the torque that I've applied to this bolt it won't return to its original shape. And that's why this bolt, this one here on the top of the suspension is called a torque to yield bolt. Now you may wonder why, why do that? Well, Mercedes has very accurately calculated the strength of this bolt. And they worked out that the ultimate yield strength, the ultimate clamping force of this bolt isn't in elastic deformation, it's in its plastic deformation. And that basically means that they can use a smaller bolt, it costs them less money, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you an idea, these were a one day order item for Mercedes near me. So that shows you that they don't hold stock of this item. Think of that what you will, but they would have to order that in. I'd just like to say a big thank you to Martin at All Data that helped me confirm my suspicion with this bolt. I contacted them and said, please can I have a trial subscription to their online workshop manual service? And they were like, yeah, absolutely no problem. And thank you very much for them for giving me that trial subscription because I did have a suspicion about it, but I wouldn't have truly been able to say that, that yes, that was a torque to yield bolt without all data's help. So thank you very much for giving me that all data and Martin all data, massive help. As the caliper bolts are 180 newton meters of torque, they are a single use item. And so are to be replaced every time that you take them off with new ones. And the rest of the process, you know it by now. So don't forget to torque your wheel bolts. And there goes the light. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video. Thank you very much for watching. If you're gonna do this on your car, let me know. I may have a few questions about why I didn't torque up the center spline, the wheel hub nut, and that's because the pre-assembled component from Mercedes already has the splines cut in at the end. So this nut has been pre-torqued from Mercedes and they've already clamped the nut onto the spline so that you don't have to do it when you install it on your car. Thank you very much for watching. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, if you learned something today. Subscribe if you really liked it because it helps me out and I hope to see you on the next video. Cheers.